Greetings YouTube, greetings everyone, and please welcome back our regular guest, Cookie Pyrex. You can't turn me into a fish. And a brand new guest, Ben. Nothing in the world can stop me now. Aha. Uh -huh. And without further ado, uh, this week we are discussing The Underwater Menace, written by Jeffrey Orme, directed by Julia Smith. The TARDIS lands on a deserted volcanic island. The Doctor, Ben, Polly and Jamie are captured and taken the lift down a shaft below the seabed. They become prisoners of the survivors of Atlantis. Their high priest, Lolum, declares they are to be sacrificed to the great god Ando. As they are about to be fed to a pool of sharks, Professor Zaroff arrives. He is a renegade scientist who has devised the technology from which the plankton food the Atlanteans uh, live on has been refined. The doctor persuades the professor to hire him for his scientific staff. Zaroff has a plan to raise Atlantis from the sea. Uh, this story is in no way bad, but I, w uh, but I would say enjoyable in a 50s B-movie way. Uh, Troughton and the producer made that comparison themselves. It is also it is perhaps embarrassing for classic Who fans, as it contains everything non-fans expect. A bizarre plot, a shrinking violet slash arm candy companion. Actually, seriously, how much screaming and how many times captured? Was she going for a record there? Anyway, um, outlandish costumes and an over-the-top villain with no real motive. It also manages to be sexist, classist and xenophobic all at once. Uh, now, Ben, uh, you're, um, you're our new guest. Um, so could you, first of all, uh, tell us about yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Ben. Um, not Jackson. Ben Isaac here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm currently living in San Francisco, and I've been in Doctor Who since 1995, which I was living off of Seventh Doctor stuff through PBS. Wait, wait. You've been Doctor Who? Well, no. I have been watching Doctor Who since uh, the mid-90s. <laughs> you should have gone uh -huh. with it. You should have gone with it, but okay. Yes, <laughs> I'm totally the Doctor, yes. Um... I'm, I'm just a, another incarnation, yes. Uh, well, if the Doctor can be Scottish, I'm sure the 13th Doctor can be a, a San Franciscan... Is that what they're called? Anyway. Uh, well, um, yes. I'm not natively from San Francisco. I'm natively from New Jersey, but it's a longer story. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, and, okay, well, as we always go alphabetically, your name is Ben. Right. Um, shall we begin with uh, your general thoughts on this story? Yes. Two points that you... Um, uh, I don't want to miss you up, um, just to keep you in line. Uh, Jamie McCrimmon's back in the saddle again with this episode. Uh, mm -hmm. the, main, it, the main interesting thing I thought was the whole... Uh, the Doctor walking up to an Irish person that he's never met before and says, Ah, you're Irish, you can set up a riot. Which I thought was hilarious. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you've never met this guy before. Ah, yes, well, um... Uh, excuse me, Mr. Irish Wilson. Uh, yeah. uh, what is it? Um, look, um, could you just go over there and um, start a riot for me? All right, <laughs> see you later. Uh, uh, but, yeah, uh, I, I think no. the um, the representation of the Irish character is something that uh, I definitely intend to come to. Yes. Uh, as I say, th this... this um, Really, this this this, uh, this serial achieves everything. There is sexism, there is xenophobia, there is classism. Um, but um, anything else to say about the story? Oh yes, uh, I have a theory that the Doctor is secretly working with the IRA to uh, get to this <laughs> Zaroff person, and the, and Zaroff's basically a reincarnation of some kind of Hitler esque kind of uh, motif. So whoever wrote the story is very pro um, Ira Ireland. Strangely enough, right. and for some reason, anti-Hitler. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody's anti-Hitler. I mean, come on. Actually, the IRA weren't. The IRA helped the Nazis. Oh, okay. My history's bad then. Um, <laughs> so apparently, they're pro. Oh, okay. They're more. Okay, let me change my idea then. So maybe they're they're more like unions, and and. 
and people that, you know, against the machine and how, you know, evil dictators are destroyed by uh, the Britishness of reality, I guess? I don't know. Honk if you honk if you support the strike of the fish people. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Koki, your general thoughts on this story? Sacrificing humans to heathen gods. The, the, the talk about idols and their religion, and then in the end, no more temples will build in Atlantis without gods. Which, on the one hand, I'd like to sort of pretend that that's sort of like a yay, no religion kind of line, but clearly it's a very yay, anti-indigenous religions kind of line. Um... Which reminds me of um, Forbidden Planet, this old fifties movie that they're talking about, like um, look about the look at the world that God has made, the world that God has made for us, or something. I don't know. I, Doctor Who's never really bothered me on like the kind of religious thing before. Mm. Um, but you mentioned xenophobia. It's not just against the Irish. It's against this sort of um, straw indigenous people thing. Well, that's mm. the thing. It's not a straw indigenous people. It's basically a representation of everything they see as wrong and savage. You know, idolatry, human sacrifice, um, mm. even eating bizarre foods and just having a different way of life and it's different, therefore wrong. You know, I, the, the line, you're not going to turn me into a fish. What the hell is wrong with being a fish? Because it's different, basically. <laughs> Look at the horrible <laughs> things that they do to their people. I, I don't know. That, that just kind of bugged me. But at the same time, it bugged me on a social level, but it was really engaging just because it, they created this little culture. And, you know, I really like that feeling of sort of, um, I guess, exoticness. You know, I've always talked about this. This is why I like Marco Polo. This is why I like to touch on the art that they put into different animals and whatnot. You know, Doctor mm. Who's really good at sort of like immersing you into this world and giving you a sense of sort yeah. of like um, trailblazing and adventure. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, xenophobia-wise, I think there were... I think I think I can identify quite a few kinds. I actually think that Zaroff is presumably meant to be German or Austrian or something, and it's a ludicrous stereotype, um, and, and, and all kinds of things like that. But yeah, the imagination of this. I actually really love all the, um, the visuals, and uh, I actually only watched this this week. I watched it twice this week. Uh, I heard the audio a while back, where you obviously you have to imagine the fish people, and I thought they'd be poorly realised. I was like, oh, oh, they're going to be crap, aren't they? Actually, I really like the fish people, yeah. I, and I really like the ho- yeah. <laughs> It was all done really well. I, I like their costumes and whatnot. I think the aquatic theme is kind of weird, that, but it's basically a trend in all depictions of Atlantis. You know, I mean, mm. yeah, they sunk under the sea, but their culture wasn't about being under the sea before they sank. Mm. Then again, I presumably mm. this would have been thousands of years, and maybe they forgot that they worshipped bulls. But that's but it's supposed to be 1970, there. isn't it? Huh? It's 1970, and Atlantis has been found. Okay. Uh, yeah, because they, they deduce um, that it's uh, after 1968, and I think they say 1970 at one point. Hence, Zaroff obviously isn't from there, but he's somebody who actually found or was aware of the, the, of the location of Atlantis. Um, and to be fair... These people don't want to abandon their home and just just go and live among other humans elsewhere. They want the resurrection of their of their home, you know. Um, can I interject? Hmm. I thought that, well, coming from left field with this, um, I think the most funniest line of of when they're talking about the fish people is when um, uh, Polly talk basically is about to be transferred into a first fish person and. It's like, well, how do you do it? It's like, oh, we we have plastic gills we put on to you. How would that mm. work? Did the props department, like, throw that line in just to, for kicks and giggles? <laughs> well, realistically, any kind of gills probably wouldn't be enough to provide oxygen to organisms with, you know, the complex muscular systems that we have. Um, you know, that's no, like... No, I, I'm 
from like a writer's point of view. I'm saying like because you know I, I write screenplay sometimes, and I, I actually thought that was like the props department walking up to the writer and be like, "Hey, could you just throw that line in for us, please?" <laughs> uh, but I like the whole sort of um, transhumanism thing. I don't know how, how like high tech plastic must have seemed in the '60s. Um, mm. Now it sounds kind of corny, but I mean, in a lot of ways, plastic is pretty state of the art. Hmm. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. And um, also, my biggest confusion with the episode was how everyone, like, Jamie and Ben kind of had the same role, and it was kind of interesting for them to kind of split off at certain points. Hmm. Because later on you'll see, like, in, spoiler alert if you haven't seen Doctor Who before, Jamie, like, if you've seen the first episode you guys saw earlier... He's definitely a masculine kind of role, and he's definitely a protector type, but so is Ben, so it's kind of weird to see both of them doing the same kind of job twice. Like, they didn't really know what Jamie was going to do, because they didn't figure he'd stay yeah. on. Yeah, it, it's the last time that, uh, when Ben and Polly leave, it's the last time they actually have three companions for a very long time. Right. Not until the 80s that they have three companions again. Um... And, yeah, I think it's a mistake. They, they come to establish just having one or two companions before long. Um, and um, I've got to say, um, I'm quite glad that Ben and Polly don't stick around for too long. Uh, not because, I mean, I'm okay with Ben, actually. Um, but um, uh, Jamie's kind of uber companion, everyone knows that. Or he will become uber companion. Um and the thing about Polly is, last week she was just starting to be something. And this week, as I say, I think this serial is the worst for scream and get captured, scream and get captured, scream and get captured, um, in terms of a female companion. Um, like, I don't think this writer knew what to do with Polly at all. Yeah, and also maybe he's going by the first Doctor stuff where it's like, you know the granddaughter mystique of, like, oh, hey, you need to be over here. Oh, I'm sorry, you need to be over there. Oh, now you got a new dress on. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, but, uh, obviously, Polly, she's not the first screamer. Uh, she won't be the last. Uh, but, uh, will it persist as bad as it did with Susan, though? Uh, screamer in classic who was Mel. Mel is many years away with great companions in between. Um, yep. I would say, well, the next female companion is Victoria, who definitely did scream. In fact, the actress got the nickname Leather Lungs because she was so good at screaming. Whether she was as bad as Polly, I can't tell you. Um, I don't know the Ben and Polly era well enough. And also, like... Um, uh, I I have never watched the Victoria era sequentially before. Um, the thing with Ben and Polly, if you guys reviewed it, because a lot of it's missing, from what I understand from the wiki page, Ben and Polly are kind of like replacements to Ian and Barbara in reality. Like, when the first mm. doctor, first doctor kind of just kidnaps them blatantly. Like, yes, so Ben and Polly, when they first were introduced, it's kind of like the doctor is having a hard time opening it, the TARDIS, and it's like, oh, excuse me, young man, could you please open this door for me? And he's just hanging out with his girlfriend, and he's like, oh, sure, I'm just hanging out with, you know, off to go to the, off to this, uh, you know, the ship I'm supposed to go on, but sure, old man, I'll totally help you open this box. Slam him in, start the TARDIS, leave. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, they never managed to replace um, uh, Ian and Barbara full stop. Uh, you know, they just... Ian and Barbara were Ian and Barbara. I, I um, didn't like these people from the start. I guess I do see some of Ian and Ben. Um, but, yeah, I just didn't like their dynamic from the start. I still don't like how they talk. They just come off as really dumb. You know, it's like, where do you think we are? Cornwall. And it's like, I was right last time, wasn't I? Uh, I don't know. I just did not feel yeah. them as companions. Um, when I talked about Clark... Sorry, uh, Ben? Oh, no, my point is, this is the only Ben in Doctor Who history. 
ever. Like, there's never been a Ben since, and it just strikes me odd, you know? Um, how do you mean? <laughs> All well, companions should be named Ben. No, no, I mean, seriously, there's been only one Ben companion. There's been Danny's, there's been, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jamie's, they've been, you know, so, so forth and so on, but with Ben, they never really bothered him because the seasons with Ben and Paula, I guess, been just not really seen in, I guess, and just hey, the name kind of never stuck. There like, have I'm, been more Bens than there have been Cookies. So, there. The Doctor Universe is only one Ben. I'm just pointing Check that out. Check your privilege. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah. Yes. Um... No. I'm just saying, as a person named Ben, it's kind of, like, hard to be, like, oh, yeah, like, because, you know, when you go to cons and people are like, oh, yeah, Ben, like, what? And I'm like, no, seriously, it was a Ben a Ben companion. Like, no, there wasn't. Uh, yeah, I feel like going into denial once they're out of the series as well. <laughs> uh, there, no, uh, I have no Ben. That, that Ben and Polly don't don't stick around even to the end of this season, so don't worry. Um, what yeah. I will say, what annoyed me in this one, and it's this is why I included classism in my list, is when Ben says to Polly, uh, "Oh, go on, you can talk foreign," because it just <laughs> get it gets across that a Cockney is automatically an ignorant person. You know, oh, you you either speak English or you speak foreign, you know. And it's like I've only ever heard people say that I've lived in the East End and I've been I've lived in London my whole life. You only hear people say things like that jokingly. It's always ironic. It's not that if you're working class from London, you would actually genu- sincerely say something. Like, you can talk foreign. It's interesting. Polly knows at least three other languages. Uh, although in the Hooniverse, that's not much of a life skill, but uh, or we know that. But then yeah. that's already established, kind of, because if you understand cavemen, you understand Marco Polo, you understand the Aztecs, um, you know, you've deduced by this point there's some translatory thing going on. But nonetheless, though, um, they think they're in Mexico, and Polly tries French first, then German, then Spanish yes, third. I noticed that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you went, like, I mean, to Polly's credit, if you actually went to Spain and you tried out French, they would roughly know what you're talking about. Why would you open like, with French if you know Spanish? Yeah, but, you know, these people could be, you know, foreigners not from the place. She doesn't know. Go with the most likely... Go with the most likely bet. Also, she goes with German second, and that's not even one of the romances. German's kind of a weird one to follow. Yeah. (laughs) But, um... Oh, so... Kind of tailing off. Yeah, I was just thinking about, like, I could find myself smack dab in the middle of Norway, and the first person I try to communicate with is Hungarian... (laughs) <laughs> uh, no, I mean, but, yeah. going off of oh. more of the so- social motif, because I think we have more stamina with that one, I think the most important thing about the episode is how the Doctor kind of feels sorry for Zarloff at the end. Like, he literally says, I need to go back for him. Like, if this was a true Hitler guy, wouldn't the Doctor be like, screw him? You know, we should discuss the villain now. Um, yeah. I think we should, yes. But can, can I quickly make the point that we've seen the Doctor unable to kill Davros before now? In fact, in the new series, he tries to save Davros, I'm just saying. But isn't Davros yeah, basically space he's Hitler? He's basically Hitler. He's worse than Davros. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, Koki, your, your yeah. views on Zaroth. Who, can I say, in the whole, because I've discussed this with fans before, in the entire in the entirety of Classic Who, the only villain who didn't have a proper motive was Zaroth. Okay, I know it's dumb, but they only did it once. Right. Um, he did have a motive, actually, and that's kind of what I I, I am not pleased with. 
you know, the idea of the pursuit of knowledge, um, wanting, or I guess in this case, well, equating the pursuit of knowledge with the pursuit of uh, power, the idea that scientists disregard not only their own well-being, but the well-being of the world, because the idea is that you can explore too deep, you can go too far. You know, um, this sort of very, um, I can't think of the word, but, you know, um, and religion is a big deal in this episode, so I guess that's kind of why um, the scientific stuff really bugs me. The idea that all scientists are just trying to unlock, like, the greatest thing and don't care about the well-being of others. You know, I'm going to destroy the world because I don't give a damn, because science just... And, of course, you know, they're going to sort of make the equi equiv equivocation of, you know, um, science and Nazism, because we always treat the Nazis as something that, uh, as a group of people, you know, pop culture, rather, treats the Nazis as a group of people that weren't religious, that were very calculating, very sort of, um, you know, scientific, as opposed to the fanatical people that they were. We, we like to pretend that it was all just science and calculations that wanted to get that disregarded human life, which is very much what they're doing with this German sort of guy in this, you know, very non-Christian setting. Just saying. Um, yeah, I suppose that hadn't really, uh, hadn't really occurred to me. I guess because that we, that we have that line, the doctor just says, because the doctor's a scientist as well, but he says, you know, uh, Zaroff's as mad as a hatter. And it's sort of the idea, because when, when Zaroff says, you know, um, something, uh, almost, he almost says, isn't it the dream of every scientist to destroy the world? Which is like, it's so obviously mental and over the top. And the actor has looked at the script and gone, there's only one fucking way to play this. I'm going to be a fucking panto villain. Yeah, I well, suppose but, they could, could have been going for the mad scientist angle. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I still feel as, I guess, um, the way they were treating it. Though they did show the clash between, like, sort of the science and the, the heathen ways. You know, the whole thing of, we heard the voice. Uh, it was like, don't you believe um, the miracles from our gods? Like, I believe what I can see. You know, um, which, by the way, I thought that was really interesting, really compelling. <laughs> you know, they believed in the miracle, and then the, the scientist cover is basically blown because he makes it clear he doesn't believe in any of this kind of stuff. He's not with them. He is a scientist. But, yeah, I don't know. Just the way yeah. it's handled is weird. But he also makes false promises from the get-go to these people. So it's like, imagine the intro scene where it's like Zaroff comes in to Landis and it's like, Hey, everybody, I have good, good news and bad news. Uh, okay, what's the good news? The good news is I can totally get you out of the ocean. Okay, what's the bad news? The bad news is you have to stop believing your gods. Well, fuck that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you're right, it's like East versus West kind of thing. Where it's like, you know, uh, you know, your original culture, your original belief system merged with something that you're forced to deal with. And, yeah, hmm. the idea that, you know, uh, the British people, well, I guess the doctor's technically not British, but, you know, the idea that our way is sort of the happy middle between cold, calculating science that disregards human life um, and, you know, mysticism and heathen idols. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess, you know, obviously everyone's going to be viewing this through a different lens, but, you know, I kind of see this as sort of a, you know, on the one hand, you can't be too scientific, you can't search too deep, but on the other hand, you can't um, go after all of the gods because... And they don't really say it, you know, it's like... And maybe when they say, you know, let's build an Atlantis without gods, maybe it really was a general sort of anti-religious message, but I kind of saw it as a bit more of a, you know, Christian supremacy over other religions message, but I don't know. Yeah. Keep in mind, Doc, like, what's going on in plot, like, the real world at the time, and what they're... Like, because almost... I almost see this as a parable kind of deal of, like, hey, science can go too far, but religion can go too far, too. Like, from the get-go of the episode, like, we see our compa the Doctor's companion is thrown another place. The Doctor has no idea what he's going for. 
the doctor has to lie to the guy just saying, I have a secret, which basically lets his friends go, but then he's like, I have nothing. It's like, you know, the, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the invisible coat, like the, um, you know, the emperor not wearing clothes idea. That's true. Oh. And Doctor's always been clever about his deception. Oh, except for that one drone tastic moment that he just pulls the thing in front of everyone and like, oh, I, I, I'm so clumsy. I did that by accident. Really, Doctor. Yeah, never really. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that that's very Patrick Troughton, which brings me on to something else actually. Because now, Koki, you've seen your first live action. Patrick Troughton Doctor, so what do you think? You know, not bad. This, I mean, I, I did, like, I, there, there are issues with the episode that I found problematic, but like I said, I did like it. I thought it was very imaginative, and I thought mm. the Doctor's role, um, it played out well enough. I, I did like him in it. Um, but, you know, I, it's also tinted by the, the sort of, whimsy feeling of adventure that I think this episode sort of gave me that I haven't had in a while. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, can you see the Matt Smith? Or rather, do you now, in retrospect, see the Patrick Troughton in Matt Smith? Hmm. I suppose I do, yeah. He has that sort of energy about him. Uh-huh. Well... You can totally see with the bow tie, right? Like, the whole, like, ah, <laughs> Jamie, well, you see, uh, I have a small uh, thing in my pocket. Hold on. And, like, he has all these things, and, you know. Well, that's a yeah. little later, but, he like... He didn't flute uh, in this episode, right? He no. fluted in... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I think he did briefly. Yeah. Ah, he did. He did, and also he randomly has this really large recorder just in his pocket randomly. He also has a lot of other stuff in his pocket. Uh, and also he has that hat that everyone seems to dislike, which is definitely a Matt Smith kind of, they reference that a lot. Yeah, that, that, that hat doesn't last long. There's no river song to shoot it off, even though she's supposed to have met past doctors. Oh, maybe that happens off screen. Yeah. No, I mean, that just freaking do like comic book style on that, where it's just like, oh, yes, canon. No. Yeah. Retroactively Moffatize Classic Who? What are you doing? No. I not with know. that attitude. Yeah, that is true. I'm clearly not I'm clearly not Moffitting hard enough. Yeah, like Moffat would have like because I recently um speaking of Second Doctor and this relates to the episode, Moffat recently wrote basically the um like, if every single Doctor met Matt Smith, what would they do kind of episode? Where it's, like, already online. And the episode that happens, basically, uh, right after, the, between the one we're going to watch next week and the one we just watched, and between that, is Matt Smith show us up. It's like, hey, hey, second version of me, I want you to go to this moon base. And he's like, what? Okay. But this time, though... We really get to find out how the Doctor deals with pressure. We also learn how the Doctor is different than his younger version of himself, or older, or whatever you want to call it, um, with uh, Charlton, or, well, you know, first Doctor stuff. Like, he actually is proactive, he actually deals with situations, and he's a lot more proactive than his counterpart. Because, you know, Ben and Polly only knew was this old guy that just basically was like... Yes, I don't like this. You go out and figure it out. I'm going to stay here. This doctor is definitely more proactive. He actually at least deals with the situation, has plans, plots, and tries to at least save everybody, which is different. Because, you know, since the first time we saw him, he didn't really know, you know what I mean? It's like kind of the standard for the rest of Who. Um, yeah, I do. I, yeah. I know, I was just going to ask a sort of general question. Um, we're replacing the Earth's core to make it into a spaceship versus um, launching Atlantis in the air so hard that it will cause the Earth to crack um, because it will drain the ocean for science. 
which would you say is more absurd? Because on the one hand, destroying the world for science because you just don't care, it seems more plausible than <laughs> trying to make the Earth into a spaceship. Just saying. Oh, okay, because most people, when they talk about this, um, and I'm bothered by this being the most tropey uh, uh, Doctor Who in terms of the female companion, but most people will say the over the top was at the beginning we had Nashing and Shifaz can stop me now! The, the ideas in this episode, which are, as we've said, so imaginative, they could... That, that, that's actually a good question. Could this have been better if the ideas, the fundamental ideas were the same, but they somehow did it without... Well, ideas and themes, but they somehow did it without the ridiculously over-the-top insane villain. Uh, Ben? Yeah, I mean, this episode could have been about um, uh, riots and revolution and... Uh, actually, the, if you, spoiler alert, the fourth actor actually redid this episode, weirdly enough. Not in the same style, mind you, but the idea of a group of people that are subjugated and the doctor helps them to become free. And I think that could have been explored more in this. Where. Oh. What, which which um, Tom Baker one do you mean? Oh, uh, I don't remember the episode on top of my head, but basically the Doctor comes into a place and literally topples a regime and then just leaves. Oh, okay. This is, um, this is the era of um, Laura Ward as, um, as, um, as his companion. The second Romana. Um, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. That could maybe be a... I think it should yeah, be noted that this kind of revolution thing has happened before in the series as well. Well, yeah, but I think they could have been pushed more the whole, you know, let's stop the food thing. I mean, it would have been more interesting without the scientist element if it was just a, an overpowered religious regime that was basically forcing these people into slavery, which was, was not addressed at all in the episode. Like, maybe yeah. a little bit, but not really. Like, yeah, I think if they you restructured it from a... Oh, yeah. No, no so totally. they sort of treated they, like they the slavery of thing. Uh, you first. Yeah, I mean, it could have been really interesting. Like, if you had the the, the Caesar kind of guy that they kind of hint at as being in charge, as being in charge. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, Koki, go hello. ahead. Yeah. Um. Okay, what I was saying is that, um, yes, then, so, um, they sort of treat, you know, the subjugation of people as part of the whole heathen package, I think. Um, you know, it kind of goes into this oriental mysticism they usually portray, you know, servants and such being abused, but, I don't know, maybe I'm, like, viewing this through a certain lens and that's not really what's happening at all. But um, also, you know, without that, the ridiculousness of, you know, Polly's going to get operated on, turn off the power, Polly's yeah. doing this, got to save her, Polly's, you know, um, if it were less, like like you said, less tropey, could it have been done well? Um, I, the setting alone makes it awesome. So if you could get rid of the, you know, annoying parts of it, I think it would have been a lot better. Well, yeah, especially yeah. those costumes of the under, you know, the actual fish people. They looked awesome. Yeah, I I loved I more pe- we need more people cosplaying as fish people. Also, have you seen them in color? Cuz they are psychedelic. Uh, uh, psychedelic was the word my girlfriend used. If you see a color photo of the fish people, you kind of go Oh, if only this were, were a colour cereal. Because they make them like bright orange, like goldfish. I'm going to Google this now. Really? That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, if it would, had been all about the fish people from the get-go, like the doctor lands on this mysterious world and the fish people let him in, and the fish people explain the problem and they, like, you know, they have it some kind of translator device or something so the doctor understands... 
And then yeah. immediately afterwards, they're taken to the place and it's like, ah, yes, Doctor, you see, we have to sacrifice the fish people in order to keep them enslaved. Blah. And then have, instead of this evil scientist, have the guy who's running the whole show actually evil. Then that would have made things a lot more interesting. That's all you had to do. The rest of it's all there. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, great ideas, great themes, and Koki, if you can't find it... Wait, uh, did you hear me? I... Oh, yes? Yeah, uh, I found it, actually. Oh, you found it? You see, you've got a fish person in colour. Yeah, um, this, is, this is pretty... wow. <laughs> okay, I think it's time to do high point, low point. So, uh, Ben, can you give us uh, your uh, favourite parts or idea, theme, elements, um, and your least favorite? The high point for me was seeing Janie, like, in the TARDIS for the first time out. Like, I wish that would have been, like, the whole thing, the, really, the, I don't know, it just felt, di- like, it was, he wasn't used to it yet. It was like, he was still trying to figure out how the machine worked, and he wasn't really feeling safe yet. I don't know, to me, that was just the most interesting high point. The low point to me was the whole killing off the, the actual king really quickly for no reason. There was no dialogue. He was barely there at all. The doctor has a really about right to see the guy about to deal with the issue. And the, and the actual king seems like a decent dude because he was like, okay, I'll actually negotiate with the fish people. Fish people and I will get along. And then Zaroff just walks in and gets a gun and shoots him. Where did he get the fucking gun from? I don't know. Doctor Who plots. Ugh. Oh. Oh. Okay, and uh, Koki, your high point and low point. I'd say that my high point was that moment where, um, you know, the the doctor getting away with like this huge religious experience for the people, and um, you know, uh, Zaroff is insisting that it didn't happen, and just this whole clash of you know, don't have faith in miracles or whatever. Um, I thought that was, I enjoyed watching it just because it, 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 you know, it fleshed out the world. It gives you a feel for how the people think and feel, albeit, you know, it sets them as a very sort of superstitious and primitive people. But, you know, I felt as though it added a lot to the world and, you know, it added that element of tension between, you know, the science and the heathen ways. Um, but for no point, just that whole thing with the doctor saving Polly by, like, pretending to be stupid, you know, like, oh, no, I expected nothing less from you. And, you know, it's like, oops, I accidentally pulled the fuse. Uh, I, I don't know, I just thought it was silly. Actually, no. My low point would be the whole thing of we will build a stone stem. It's like, no, let's build an Atlantis without the gods. You know, as if they have been shown the way. But, yeah. So those, that, that's my low point. Ah, okay. Um, trying to remember what mine were uh, now. Uh, well, I could I could just have my my um, high point as just being the um, being the designs. I think just as I say that the fish people costumes, the fish people were well realised. Um, and um, low points. Oh, my my actual low point. Yeah, I I've, I've already said it. It's the it's the idea. And it actually, but the classism bothers me. The stereotyping of cockneys bothers me more than the sexism or xenophobia for some reason. I think it's just a source. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's because I'm a London. Um Just the idea of um, go on, Polly. You can talk for him. Um, but uh, although at least the, the only kind of initiative or any any gumption that Polly has, the only thing Polly has in this serial is that she's apparently multiling- multilingual, which hasn't come up before. But Ben seemed to know it. Don't know if it comes up again. Um, but um, yeah, um, okay. So I'm gonna go round and get final thoughts and goodbyes. So uh, Ben, your first. Ever, sure. Doctor Who Friday's final thought and goodbye. Final thoughts. Um, this is a Doctor Who episode that you shouldn't show your friends unless they really, really like Doctor Who. It's like, it's kind of like uh, a few episodes that you just, 
uh, it's not like the gunslinger at least, but it's kind of just awkward and you need to have it with a, a tinge of salt. You know what I mean? But uh, it, it confirms all the stereotypes of yeah, what Doctor Who uh, is. And, and you yeah. need to take it with a bit of salt and, you know, not take it so literally. But, you know, bye for a yeah. minute, I guess. Ah, and thank you very much for being on and hope to have you on again. And Koki, your final thought and goodbye. Um, okay, you can turn me into a fish. Really. Uh, I, just, <laughs> I just think that uh, the whole transhuman element is actually pretty cool. Um, even though they, they portray them as sort of monsters of science. Um, you know, it's different, therefore, burn it. That being said, I, I think I have a more positive opinion than Ben of the episode, just because I... It, it, um, and maybe it is, like, cliched, but it is kind of what I want and expect from Doctor Who, you know, the sort of adventurous setting that you sort of immerse into uh, a new world, even if it's for a single story arc, um, and, you know, I felt like this world kind of pulled me in, so on that, well, it's, you know, I put it up there with some of the other serials that I liked, I, I did enjoy myself throughout it, even if I did find some aspects a bit problematic. But, um, may the hamster of Atlantis rest upon your head. Excellent. And uh, next week we have another four-parter, and it's another one that half exists. This time, though, the half that doesn't is animated. Um, so, um, please join us next week for the Moonbase. Base. <laughs>